Well, good morning, Cedar Creek. Thank you. Uh, great to have all of you joining us today, whether you're doing that in person at one of our campuses or online, either way, I'm just really glad that you're here. And I just have to tell you, it is great to be able to be back up here teaching this morning. I have to tell you, five weeks is a really, really long time for me. So I I hope I remember how to do this teaching thing, but I do want to take just a moment and say thank you to our incredible teaching pastor team who over the last month did an incredible job, right? Yeah. Walking us through that Old Testament book of Jonah. It's like, who knew? Who knew that that four little chapter uh, Old Testament book about a man and a fish and all of that, who knew that it had so much truth to speak into and relevance for our daily lives? We are blessed as a church, as a congregation, and I'm so thankful for you. Now, you can probably see today we're kicking off a new series of messages called selfless. And for the next five weeks, we're going to explore what is one of the most important, and yet at the same time, one of the most difficult aspects of our faith journey, and that is to selflessly serve others. That's like one of the hardest things to do as a Christian, right? Like read my Bible, yeah, I could do that. Pray, yeah, I could do that. Sacrificially put the needs of others ahead of my own. Well, I don't know, kind of busy, right? And yet sacrificial service is supposed to be the hallmark of who we are as Christ followers. It is supposed to be what people recognize most about us because we live in a culture that is directly counter to this idea of selflessness. We live in a selfish culture. We live in a culture that is all about self-promotion. We're all about getting ahead. We're all about getting our name out there, being known, right? I mean, if you stop and think about it, isn't that really kind of the whole deal with social media right? Isn't it really kind of just a website dedicated to the glory of me, right? Where I can share with everybody what I like, what I don't like, what I'm doing, where I'm going on vacation, what I think, what, you know, all of that. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-social media. It is a wonderful tool, and we use it very effectively here as a, a church to share hope and good news, but the tendency is to use it for our own self promotion. We do that with a lot of things. In fact, a recent survey, uh, 12 to 14-year-old kids were asked, what is it you dream of doing with your life? What do you most want to be? Or like we used to say, what do you want to be when you grow up? This amazed me. 54% of our teenagers answered they wanted to be famous. They wanted to be a celebrity, which in this culture means being a social media influencer, right? I want to get my name out there. I want to have a YouTube channel. I want everybody to know all about me. And yet Jesus calls us not to a life of promoting ourselves. He calls us as his followers to a life of denying ourselves. He said it very clearly. If anyone wants to come after me, He must deny himself, pick up his cross, and then and only then can you follow me. Putting the needs of others ahead of our own is what we are as believers to always be all about. So let me ask you a question. If the people who know you best were to describe you using the word always, what would they say? What would they say you are always doing? Oh, you know her, she is always encouraging others. Or maybe they might say, oh, you know him, he's always griping and complaining. (laughs) Oh, Oh yeah, you know her, she's always sharing her faith or she's always scrolling on her phone or, you know, he's always working or she's always working out. What would people say you are always doing? 
Because as Christ followers, the most important outward character trait that people should see about us is that we are a selfless people. In Acts chapter 9, there's a very brief but powerful passage about a Greek woman who had a huge impact, not just in her church, not just in her community, but in the entire early church in the book of Acts. And notice what the Bible says about her. Acts 9 verse 36. In Joppa, that's a town, in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name was Dorcas. I think we just got a pause right there, right? You feel it, right? What kind of parent names their child Dorcas, right? Imagine what middle school would have been like for her. Interestingly, the, the word Dorcas in Greek literally means gazelle, beautiful, graceful, right? That, that's kind of what they saw her as. And in fact, this Dorcas, that, seems, that name seems weird to us, Dorcas was the first Greek female to be named in the New Testament. She's a rock star of the faith. Why? Well, look at the rest of the verse. Because she was always doing good and helping the poor. When people thought about Dorcas, the always for her was she's always serving. She's always helping others. Imagine having that legacy. What are the chances that your family would put that on your tombstone? Always serving, always helping others. And here's the thing, her service to the early church was not a big on stage. She wasn't a celebrity pastor. She wasn't a great vocalist or a musician. She didn't go out and do miracles for the early church. You know what she did? She simply sewed clothes. She made clothes and gave them to people in need. In fact, when she unexpectedly died, they sent for Peter, like Jesus' right-hand guy, one of the early fathers of the church, St. Peter, right? He came all the way to Joppa when she died, and he raised her from the dead. And a revival broke out, not just in her church, but all across the city of Joppa. Imagine that your ministry, your selfless service to the church and to the community was so important that God would raise you from the dead so you could keep on doing it. So what I want us to talk about today is how can we be a Dorcas? How can we be a Dorcas? How can serving others selflessly become not just something we do, but the essence of who we are? And to help us do that, we're going to look at an interesting little drama that unfolded with Jesus, his 12 disciples, and the mother of two of his disciples. This event is recorded in Matthew's Gospel, the 20th chapter. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, turn or click to Matthew chapter 20. While you're doing that, let me give you just a little bit of context. This actually takes place very late in Jesus' earthly ministry. So his 12 disciples, they have been with them 24-7 for about probably two, maybe even two and a half years. And over that time, they have started to figure out that Jesus was not just a good teacher, that he wasn't just another prophet sent from God. He wasn't just a miracle worker. They had figured out that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. That he was long, the long-awaited Messiah who would come and redeem and rescue the nation of Israel. And they knew that Messiah would usher in the kingdom of God. But in their minds, that kingdom would be an earthly kingdom that Jesus would set up a power base in Jerusalem to, to kick out the, the Roman oppressors, to fix the corrupt religious system of the nation of Israel. And so they're thinking, we're in his inner circle. We're about to be in positions of authority. This thing is moving forward. It's coming, and we've got a front row seat 
for it. And in the middle of that context, notice what happens. Starting with verse 20. It says, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, that's two of Jesus' disciples, they ca- she came to Jesus with her sons. And she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, Jesus asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right and the other on your left. In other words, she's saying, Jesus, I want my boys to be on top. I want them to have positions of honor in your kingdom. Now, you can't really blame a mom, right? That's kind of a mom thing to do. Every mom wants what's best for their kids. In fact, most moms I know, they're not self-promoters, but they are kid promoters, right? Anybody got a mom like that, grew up with a mom like that? She showed up at your little league practice to make sure your coach knew that you probably ought to be pitching or playing shortstop, right? Or showed up to your dance instructor to make sure they knew you were probably the best person for the lead in the recital, right? That's kind of what moms do. That's what's going on here. But watch, it gets even more fascinating. Notice what happens next, verse 24. When the 10 other disciples heard what James had John had asked, they were indignant. If you grew up in the country like I did, indignant means they are mad as fire, right? They are angry about this, right? But notice, this is so interesting. I've never seen this before as I've read this, but notice they're mad because they believe James and John did this, right? It says what they did. They're not mad at the mom. They are pretty convinced in my mind. I think they're pretty convinced that James and John put their mother up to this, right? So you can imagine that conversation, right? Really, God? Really? You brought your mom in here to ask Jesus, I mean, come on. I thought y'all were the sons of thunder. Apparently, y'all ain't nothing but a bunch of mama's boys. But here's the thing. You know why the other 10 are mad? Because they didn't think of it first, right? (laughs) They were afraid. Look, these guys are going to get something. They're going to get ahead. They're going to get over us. And we're not giving up our position without a fight. But I love what Jesus does. Notice, beginning with verse 25. But Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world, they lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your servant slave. Now notice this. Jesus doesn't reject greatness. He just redefines it. Jesus doesn't reject the idea of wanting to be great, of wanting to be the best, of wanting to accomplish things and be successful and significant with your life. Jesus doesn't get rid of that. He just simply redefines it. He said, the path to greatness is different than the one the world has. And then he closes with this, verse 28. He says, for even the Son of Man, even me, the Messiah, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if Jesus' ultimate mission on this earth was a mission of selfless sacrifice on behalf of others, doesn't it stand to reason that those of us who claim to follow him should be all about selflessly serving others? Sure. So here's what I want to do. I want to talk about how do we do that? How do I become more selfless? And as we unpack Jesus' words... There are three keys for us to become more selfless. Three things I must do if you want to be a little more selfless. One, first thing I have to do is recognize what's natural. Recognize what's natural. You know, the only way to solve a problem is to identify 
that there is a problem, to admit that there is an issue. That's why the first step in every 12-step program is admitting that there's a problem, that there is an issue. Why? Because you will only change when you recognize there's actually something about yourself that needs to change. And there is for all of us because selflessness is not natural to us. We are not born these sweet, innocent, selfless babies who just get corrupted by the world and the schools and the culture and become self-centered. No, we start out from day one totally self-absorbed. You don't believe that? Go spend some time in our preschool area, right? The most selfish thing on the planet is a baby, right? If they're hungry, when will they want to be fed? Right now. They don't care if you've been up all night. They don't care if you're sick. They don't care anything about you. They want what they want when they want it. But here's when we need to understand. We don't outgrow that when we grow up. Oh, what we learn to do as mature adults is cover it, hide it, not be so obvious about our selfishness, but it's always there. Jesus put it this way in verse 25. She said, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority for those under them. What's he saying? He's saying, as soon as you get to a place where you got a little power, you are going to use that power for yourself. As soon as you get a little authority, as soon as you get in a place where nobody else can hold you accountable, that selfishness is going to come out. You don't believe that? Spend some time with a homeowner's association in your neighborhood, right? A little bit of power, a little bit of authority. Next thing you know, they're walking through the neighborhood like they're the sheriff, right? Telling everybody what to do. Why? Because that's what have, that is our nature. Our natural desire is always going to be to rule over others, to have it my way, to make everything all about me all the time. Louis Grizzard, the, the late great Southern comedian, said it this way. Life is like a dog sled team. If you ain't the lead dog, the scenery never changes. Right? Think about that. He's right. And so we claw and bite and step over and do everything we can to get ourselves in the lead of life. And here's the thing. That doesn't go away when you give your heart and life to Jesus. Every day of your life, you're going to struggle with this natural desire for self-centeredness. Paul, the apostle Paul, right? The greatest, most mature Christ follower who ever lived. Look at what he writes, Romans 7, 14. He says, the trouble is with me, right? It's in me for I am all too human, a slave to sin. By the way, do you know what sin is? At its heart, selfishness, right? Self-centeredness. Every sin is ultimately built on all about me. That's why the middle letter in the word sin is I. It's all about what I want. That's at the heart of sin. And Paul says, I have looked in the mirror and seen the problem, and the problem is me. It's this sin nature. All of us need to do that. You will never move towards being selfless until you look in the mirror and be honest with the fact that you struggle every day with self-centeredness and a desire to self-promote. If you don't do that, if you ignore that, if you pretend like you're better than everybody else, what you'll do is you'll just learn to work the system. Oh, it won't be obviously outward that you're self-centered, but you'll start to manipulate and try to control people and circumstances unless you are willing to take that first step and say, I am self-centered. And let me tell you something, it ain't easy to take an honest look in the mirror. I mean, you think you want to. It's easy to sit here and go, you know what? I need to face that. I need to look my own self-centeredness in the eye. Sitting in here, it's easy. But then as you get close to start doing that, it's scary. It is scary to be honest with yourself. It's kind of like when you took your little kids to Disney World 
And you know, all they wanted to do was to see one of the characters. You know how they have characters walking around the park? They wanted to see one. Like, I want to see Goofy. I can't wait to see Goofy. And then you turn the corner, there's Goofy, and they take off running. Goofy, 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 like they're going to give him a hug. And Goofy gets down to give him a big hug, and they get about three feet away, and they look at that big, weird-looking animal in the eyes, and they scream and panic and pee their pants and run back to Mama. That's what happens, right, when we really face the truth. It's not easy to do this. It's not pretty, but it is essential if you're going to become a little more selfless. I have to recognize what's natural. And then number two, I have to choose to be different. I have to choose to be different. You cannot change your natural desire towards selfishness, but you can change the choices you make. That's why Jesus says in verse 26, but among you, but among my followers, it will be different. How is it different? It's not different that your self-centered nature goes away. The difference is you now have access to God's power and God's presence through God's spirit in you for you to be able to choose against what is most natural to you. And that's what becoming more selfless is. Choosing against what's natural and battling every day for what is spiritual. It's an everyday battle. You know, you come to your campus on Sunday morning and you see all those amazing people selflessly serving at Cedar Creek, whether it's in our children's ministry, our student ministry, whether it's in guest services, whatever they're doing, you see them doing it and you think, well, they just love doing it. You think they just wake up every Sunday morning and go, I can't wait to get to church. It's certain, nobody loves working in a classroom full of three-year-olds. I mean, they might like it every now and then, but not week in and week out. You know why they're here serving? Because every Sunday when it's their turn, they wake up and they battle against their desire to just call in. Let somebody else do it. I've done it long enough. It's somebody else's turn. I'm not doing it anymore. It is a daily battle. The reason they seem so happy and enjoying what they do is because they've won that battle. They've shown up to selflessly serve, and they are finding the truth that that is where a great life is. That is where fulfillment, that is where true joy comes from. But it's a battle to make that choice. And it's not a one and done. You don't say, you know what, Philip's right. I'm going to sign up to serve over there in Kids Creek. Made that decision and it's going to be easy for you every week. It might be easy for a day. might be easy for a month. But over the long haul, you cannot do this on your own. You cannot win this battle with your selfish nature on your own. That's why, again, the Apostle Paul, You remember that in Romans chapter 7 where he's talking about those famous words where he says, the things I really want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, somehow I end up doing them. But then look at what he says right after that, verses 24 and 25. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin, selfishness, and death? And then notice what he says, thank God. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. What's he saying? He's saying that serving others is not a route to a deeper relationship with Jesus. It is the result of a deeper relationship with Jesus. Paul is saying, look, you don't get closer to Jesus because you keep showing up and serving and making the right choices. He said, no, you get closer to Jesus and the less selfish you will become, the more you lean on him, the more you cry out to him, the more you check your pride and recognize your total dependence on him for anything, the more selfless you will become. And that leads us to the third thing we have to do. To become more selfless, we have to be willing to follow Jesus' example. To follow Jesus' example. Let's go back to our little drama, right? Now we've got all 12 of Jesus' disciples who have become totally focused on themselves. 
Two who are trying to get the good seats, leveraging their mom. The other 10 that are mad because they don't want to miss out on anything that they deserve or should get. And in the middle of this outrageous display of self-promotion and self-absorption, look at what Jesus says, verse 28. He says, for even the Son of Man, the Messiah, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here's the thing. It's so easy for us to read that and go right to the giving his life as a ransom. Well, sure, Jesus was selfless. He died on a cross. He gave his life. But don't miss the and. Before Jesus did all of that on the cross, notice he said he came to serve others. Jesus did not just come to earth to die on a cross to forgive us our sins. He also came to give us an example of a life of selfless service to others. So you think about reading the Gospels and you think about all the things Jesus did in his life. We go right to the big stuff. He walked on water. He turned, uh, he turned water into wine, right? He, he raised the dead. He healed the sick. Yes, Jesus did all those things. And maybe God might equip you to do that, but probably not. Jesus was divine. You are not. And we often miss that Jesus, for his whole life on earth, was constantly serving others in simple little ways. The gospel's full. Read through the gospels. They're full of these little acts of selfless service to others. Jesus took the time to listen to people that nobody else wanted to hear from. Jesus took the time to speak to people that were marginalized and ignored by everybody else. Jesus, in a culture where kids were not just to be seen and not heard, but in a culture in the first century where kids should not be seen or heard, Jesus sat down and let groups of children come and spend significant time with him. Jesus was always doing simple little acts of selfless service to others. One of my favorite takes place not too long after this event. It's the last week of Jesus' life. And on Thursday night of that week, he's pulling all his disciples together to celebrate the Passover meal, this last supper with them. Guess what they're arguing about on their way to the last supper? Who's the greatest? Obviously, they didn't learn anything from this example because they're still fighting about who is the greatest among them. And this time... Jesus doesn't just tell them that greatness is found in serving others. Jesus demonstrates it. There at the meal, he stands up and he takes off his master's robes. He takes off the robes of God in the flesh and he wraps a servant's towel around his waist and he kneels down and one by one, he washes their feet. Not as some sort of religious symbol or ceremony, but as a simple practical need of selfless service to these selfish people around him. And then when he finishes, look at what he says. John 13, 15. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. In other words, Jesus said, look, you want to be great? You want a significant life? You want to make a difference? You want to be a Dorcas? Then go for the servant's towel, not the king's throne. Mother Teresa said it this way. Little things are indeed little But to be faithful in many little things is a great thing. So here's my question. What would that look like for you right now? What would this look like in your home with your spouse, your kids, your in-laws? What would this look like at work, at school? What would it look like for you right here in your church? See, here's the bottom line. This is the bottom line, not just for today's message. This is the bottom line for these whole next 
five weeks. This is the goal. This is where we want to get to together. And it's simply this, recognizing that genuine servanthood is without recognition and without reservation. Let me say that again. Genuine servanthood is done without recognition and without reservation. And can I tell you something, church? We can't do this on our own. We can only move towards selflessness when we tap in to God's presence, God's power, when we lean on, cry out to, and beg for Him to help us choose to be different than this broken, messed up world that we live in that is consumed with self-promotion. So let's just do this right now. Let's ask for his help right now. Wherever you are, a campus or watching online, just bow your heads just for a second. Would you ask him to help you win that battle over your self-centered nature? Would you just cry out to him, ask him to show you clearly what this looks like for you? What does it look like for you to be selfless? What does it look like for you to be a foot washer, a servant, a slave to the undeserving people around you? Oh, Father, we recognize our complete and total need for you. There is nothing in us and our nature that would ever help us be the least bit selfless. Father, help us to recognize that about ourselves and speak truth to it. Give us your spirit's power to choose differently, not in big, grandiose ways, but in little daily encounters as we leave this place. Father, help us serve selflessly so that in doing that, we can find significance, the true greatness that you've called us to. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.